Hi everyone, this is Andrew Hoffman. I'm a security architect and a technical author from the Pacific Northwest, if you're new to this channel. Otherwise, welcome back. Today I want to talk about a project that I've been working on for the last year or so that has finally been released. As you can see in front of you, this is the second edition of my web application security book. The first edition was released in 2020 and was pretty well received. And even though I was pretty happy with the result of that book, I realized that there were a number of things in that book that I would have changed if I could have written it over again. So about a year and a half ago, I contracted with O'Reilly, my publisher, to write a second edition. And in this video, I kind of wanted to give you the rundown of some of the things that have changed and some of the things that may draw you to the second edition, especially if you didn't have an opportunity to read the first edition. So first and foremost, there's over 150 user submitted edits and suggestions that I have incorporated into the second edition. I wasn't able to incorporate everybody's feedback, but I was able to incorporate quite a bit given the limited time frame. Now, a lot of the changes beyond fixes and minor improvements to pacing and source code, etc. A lot of the changes are actually in the form of more advanced content. So I'm showing you the table of contents for the second edition of the book right here. And you'll notice a lot of things are still the same. We still go through a historical account of the history of software security going all the way back to around World War II, going up through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, talking about telephone freaking and the early internet and early computer hacking like the Morris worm. And then we go into recon, and quite frankly, there's not a large amount of changes in the recon section. I felt like that was more of a preliminary section. You know, in recon, there's discussion about what type of technology builds a modern web application. This has been updated. We're talking about how to find subdomains, do some API analysis, identify third-party dependencies, really how to kind of build a graph of an application that you want to attack as a white hat hacker. So that's you know, the foundation that is demonstrated in part one recon, and there's not a huge amount of changes. There are some modernizations for technologies that have changed between 2020 and 2024, but the meat of the second edition comes in part two and especially part three. So we go to part two and one of the most commonly requested sets of changes was that readers wanted more advanced content. And that's what I've been working really hard on to deliver on. You know, initially part two offense, you could read through this and get kind of a overview of the most common techniques that hackers are using to attack web applications today. So this is especially beneficial if you're pursuing a career or in a career as a pen tester, or you want to get into bug bounty hunting on platforms like HackerOne or BugCrowd. And what I've delivered on is in the second edition, there is quite a bit of advanced content. I mean, if we look at the cross-site scripting chapter, chapter 10, reached out to all my contacts, I have gone through what's available academically and, and tried to include the most advanced and most modern methods of not only deploying cross-site scripting, like cross-site scripting archetypes, but also methods of bypassing filtration, detecting XSS syncs and sources, etc. And this is carried on throughout the entire offense section. So CSRF, we have more advanced types of CSRF payloads, more advanced types of ways of delivering CSRF. Uh, there's some advanced pathways from XXE attack. So if you find an XXE vulnerability, what can you do with that? What are other types of vulnerabilities you can chain with your XXE vulnerability? And the same thing applies for injection, denial of service. And then where I think it gets really interesting is I wanted to write about some more advanced attacks that aren't commonly cited in like OWASP. So you can go to OWASP and you can learn about cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery. But there's a lot of attacks that are more niche but are actually very powerful. For example, looking at chapter 16, client-side attacks, which is a chapter that I really enjoyed writing. What are ways that we can attack a browser client? What are the advantages of attacking a browser client? So when I say browser client, these are attacks that specifically target web applications that have you know, a web front end, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, React, Vu, the browser DOM. How can, we, how can we attack the browser DOM? How can we attack these web applications without ever including a server? And, and what are the benefits? You, know, you might be in a situation where you have six months to try to attack this application and you're worried that there's logging on the back end and you want to do it in a way in which it's virtually undetectable. Well, client-side attacks is for you. And in client-side attacks, there's a wide array of types of attacks included, 
including uh, some kind of more advanced prototype pollution, click jacking, tab nabbing, etc. And then going back up a little bit, chapter 15, this was a chapter that I added in there because I thought it was valuable. And again, just some sorts of attacks that maybe aren't as common, but a lot of web application servers are affected by serialization attacks, IDOR, etc. Now we go to chapter 18. I have uh, about 10 pages on business logic vulnerabilities. I added that in here because as you may know, if you're in the security industry, business logic vulnerabilities are really, you know, the one type of vulnerability that can't be detected by automation. And so you have to have a little bit of a background in how to build a system, a systematic approach of finding business logic vulnerabilities if you're working in a capacity where number one, you're a white hat hacker, number two, you're a bug bounty hunter, or number three, even if you're a security engineer and you're trying to work through some code and trying to figure out how can I be, you know, rest assured that this code that's being deployed is relatively safe, you have to have a system set up in place for number one, figuring out the business logic, number two, mapping the business logic, and number three, finding ways around the business logic, and hence finding business logic vulnerabilities. So significant amounts of advanced content has been added to part two offense. Like I said, uh, part one recon mo has been modernized. And then we get to part three defense, and there's a lot of new content here. So the core of this book is, you know, it, it gives you an overview of the history of software security. So you have some foundation, some application reconnaissance. So you have some background and what's typically done prior to leading into part two, which is offense, where you will gain kind of a uh, intermediate level understanding of the basic requirements to perform any offensive capacity in this industry. And then part three is the meat of the book. Part three is like accumulating, uh, after accumulating all of the knowledge from the first parts and the background, what can you do with that to make your applications more secure? And that's that's really the goal of this book. And you know, it, it's there because the first two parts are really required reading. If you try to build a secure application and you don't understand how applications are being targeted, after accumulating all of the knowledge from the first parts and the background, what can you do with that to make your applications more secure? And that's that's really the goal of this book. And you know it, it's there because the first two parts are really required reading. If you try to build a secure application and you don't understand how applications are being targeted by hackers, then I really don't think you'll be as successful as someone who understands all three of these parts. So we look at part three defense right here. As you can see, we have the chapter on securing modern uh, applications, but we have quite a bit more content and secure application architecture. I thought it was really important to go into some detail on some design patterns like zero trust architecture that are at the key of not only you know many job postings today but also the philosophies that companies are implementing in order to keep their software safe now secure configuration really big meaty chapter here going through a lot of the available secure configurations that are available for web applications from csp to cores headers cookies framing and sandboxing etc and the reason I did this is because, you know, we're talking about web applications and there's a set of core technologies that every web application has to be built upon. And the reason for that is because there's standards, there's standards for like the browser DOM, there's standards for JavaScript, etc. And there's also standards that help us to implement more secure applications like content security policy or cross origin resource sharing. And a lot of people, even though they know these are there, they don't know the nuance of how to implement them correctly. And they don't know the side effects if any of these configurations aren't implemented correctly. So in this chapter, I tried to go into quite a bit of detail and explain both the benefits and the downsides. What, what can you improve in terms of your security posture if you implement these correctly? And what do you lose if you fail to implement these or you implement these incorrectly? And I think you'll actually be surprised by some of the information that I was able to, to dig up and to provide in this chapter because some of the side effects of implementing these technologies incorrectly are actually very poorly documented. You know, an example of that is when we're talking about cookies, there is a domain flag that you can put on a cookie. And a lot of people don't know that if you use that domain flag incorrectly, or actually if you just implement the do domain flag, there's some security gaps that appear in your application simply by using a flag that you may think would improve your security. And the reason being is because it actually has side effects. And if you don't read through the spec, you won't understand the side effects and what happens to subdomains. So 
I would actually really strongly suggest anyone who's building web applications that picks up this book, make sure to read chapter 22. We go to chapter 23, which is a little bit on secure user experience, a little bit of a small but new section, uh, talking about best practices that other applications have used to improve security from a UX perspective. And then of course, a nice meaty section on threat modeling, followed by some how to do good code reviews. And then beyond that, we go into vulnerability discovery, vulnerability management, etc. Now, we talked in section two about how there's some new types of advanced content for attacks. Well, there's also now advanced content for all the defense. So instead of going through the most routine forms of cross-site scripting defense, this uh, section has been now updated. And if you read through it, there's quite a few more uh, nuanced methods of eliminating or at least reducing your risk of cross-site scripting attacks. Same with CSERF and injection cross-site, uh, let's see, XML external entity, denial of service, and every other attack that's listed in part two. So for every attack in part two, there's a one-to-one -one chapter mapping in part three. So if you learn how to attack a web application using a specific attack in part two, you'll have a one-to-one -one defense in part three that you can reference when you're building your own applications. And this, this goes for even things like client-side attacks, uh, etc. So I'm not going to give you any more content than just what's in the table of contents. I need to talk with my publishing company before I can do that. I wanted to give you an overview of what is new in this second edition of the book. Now, the second edition of the book is really easy to find. I will put a link in the description below the video, but ultimately you can find it basically anywhere on the web, uh, Target, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Borders, Books, any of these major retailers. You'll probably find the first edition first on Amazon, right around here. You'll notice just 2020. And you want the most, the latest and greatest content, make sure to get the second edition. You can tell right hand corner, top right hand corner has the second edition stamped. So go check it out and let me know what you think in the comments below the video if you've read the book. And thanks for watching this video.